Hello, welcome to the Flute 360 podcast, where we incorporate a panoramic view of flute related topics. I am your host, Heidi K. Begay, and this is episode 94 Understanding the Flow State with Chris Neal, part one. Today's sponsor is brought to you by J&K Productions. Did you know that not only are they a production company for podcasts, but they are a recording company for musicians? Any musical recording needs that you may have, J&K Productions can fulfill that need. They have all the necessary equipment and expertise to record your next flute recording for college or graduate auditions, competitions, summer festivals, or a flute album. J&K Productions can record any setup imaginable, from solo flute, small chamber, flute and piano, and much more. Consider J&K Productions for your next recording project. Contact them at jkproductions.media. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Flute 360 podcast episode. Today, my wonderful guest is Chris Neal, who is a licensed professional counselor who practices in Oklahoma City. Today, Chris is going to discuss how we as musicians can obtain the flow experience within our musical performances. Welcome, Chris, to the show. Hello. How are you today? Good. How are you doing on this Friday morning? I am doing great. We've, where I live, we've had really up and down weather. And so one day it's in the teens and the next day it's in the 80s. But such is life in the lower Midwest, I guess. <laughs> we just keep everyone healthy and we do what we can. Nice. Yeah. Lots of vitamin C. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I, I'm just really grateful for the chance to come uh, talk to you about, about uh, these topics and my work. And hopefully uh, your listeners will, will find it meaningful for them. Oh, definitely. So I want to refer the listeners back to episode 92, where Chris talks about performance anxiety. And he specifically talks about how to integrate mind body approaches to help reduce the symptoms of performance anxiety. So I refer you to that just so you can check out his professional background. And we talk about that in the first few minutes of the show. So with that being said, we can dive into today's content. What do you think, Chris? Sounds good to me, Heidi. Awesome. So as a musician on the stage giving a performance, whether it's in a concert with a group or a solo recital, sometimes we have this like inner chatter, right? And it can get in the way. So talking today about the state of flow and how we can get into it, can this like help us reduce our inner chatter? Well, I think they're definitely related. I think probably a true flow state grows out of our ability to reduce that chatter. So I think flow is kind of the nirvana experience for a musician. It's kind of the result of that. So a lot of the things that we have talked about and can kind of engage further today about calming that inner voice, which to be clear, I don't think is just a matter of taking someone's advice where they say you need to think less or quit thinking so hard or get out of your own head or quit talking to yourself when you play. You know, yeah, that's the goal. (laughs) How do we do that is often a point of some debate. So yeah, I think when we can reduce that inner chatter, then it makes, makes a flow state more potentially available to us. And I think there's a lot that goes into that. So we'll Hmm. get into it. Cool. So can we establish a foundation and just state the obvious, what is the state of flow? That's a great question. I think we've probably all experienced it in some way in our lives. I think if anyone listening can remember a time when maybe you've met somebody new and you just you just really vibe with that person. And maybe you go to lunch and you're sitting there talking and you don't even remember eating your food because you're just so engrossed in the conversation and you lose track of time. 
And before you know it, it's 10 o'clock at night and you're still talking and you just are completely immersed in that experience of being connected with this other person. Or maybe sometimes we get involved in a creative project. And uh, again, one of those characteristics of a flow state is that the sense of self and the sense of time tend to kind of go away and we become wholly immersed in the creation of whatever it is that we're making. And so when we do that, it can be very exciting. It can be very fulfilling. And I think part of the thought there is that then when we can find that flow state, it it allows us to make art in ways that are kind of unencumbered by the other processes that we would normally experience in our daily lives. No, that's great. I mean, even going and doing show notes, you know, for example, for Mm -hmm. a particular episode, I re-listen to the episode and I do the show notes, upload it and you and I'm saying all this because, you know, as a podcast host, Mm -hmm. um, next thing you know, two, three hours have gone by. You're like, oh, my gosh, wow. Where did the time go? So that's a state of flow. Right. Yeah, exactly. And what we are coming to understand about flow is a lot of things are happening at that time. With the state of flow, we're coming to understand it more clearly and we're understanding the experiential part of that. Uh, We're also starting to understand the neuroscience of that. And uh, as I got involved in the neurofeedback world and began doing a lot of my training in doing brainwave training for optimal performers, kind of came to understand not only what that is like behaviorally or cognitively for us, but there's literally something that happens with your brainwaves that is reflected in a state of flow. And so it really is not just this mythical thing. It's something that I think we're still figuring out how, but the idea is that Ultimately, that might be something we can kind of measure. And if you can measure it, then maybe you can kind of start to figure out how to recreate it is maybe the goal. Well, that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing all of that wonderful information. So what I would like to know is once I've learned a piece, right, and I know the rhythms, I know the notes, I know the musical score, how can we as musicians enter into a state of flow during the artistic musical performance? I, I don't consider myself you know, an expert on this. I, I have a lot of inclinations that are kind of informed by my work with optimal performers and both through just performance coaching and my background as a teacher, mm-hmm. but again, th- through the brainwave work as well. So you're asking how we can sort of intentionally create that. Is that sort of the the question? Yes. Yeah. I think a lot of things have to happen for that to occur. You know, I live in Oklahoma City. I'm a big basketball fan here. We have the Oklahoma City Thunder. And until this last year, uh, we had a player named Russell Westbrook, which a lot of the listeners will know. Some people may not. But Russell Westbrook was one of these players. I'm going to have to find a new example since he's now moved to Houston, but he's one of those players that it's just this completely visceral, he seems just completely unencumbered by self-evaluation, self-doubt, or overthinking. Mm. And so to watch him play, it really kind of is artistry in motion. And so when I'll I'll talk with local people about this, I'll say it's kind of the Russell Westbrook effect because... Mm. He just is clearly able to go out on the court and it doesn't matter if he gets clobbered on one play or completely misses. And, you know, if I were to do that, I'd be embarrassed. I'd be kind of shy about the next time or, you know, if someone kind of knocks the ball away and, you know, I get hit, then I it, I'm, it's painful. And so clearly I could never be a basketball player. But but what Westbrook can do is just completely shake that off, even if he makes a completely horrible play one time. The next time, the odds are just as good that he's going to do something brilliant. Hmm. And so, yeah, I think that's probably a goal as a musician as well, that you know, not only can we get into a performance zone that is very fulfilling, that we're able to bring this inner musician out to inspire the world. Not only that, but I, I think there's a connection with also our ability to kind of shake off the unexpected or the unplanned or uh, errors. So I, I think there is a connection with performance anxiety and just this 
inner conversation that often tends to happen and our ability to kind of go with the flow. And can I give you a personal example from my own performance history? Oh, please. So it was actually my senior recital as a clarinet major at University of Oklahoma back in the early, early 90s. And I was playing a Brahms sonata. And there's a part in the Brahms sonata where we have this this uh, motive that goes back and forth. Piano, bum, bum, me, bum, bum. It's an eighth note, anacrusis. And then it repeats. Well, the pianist played bum, bum, and I played bum, bum. And then the pianist made an error and actually played a 16th note anacrusis. But, um, hmm. and in the moment, had I been in flow, I might have gone, but, um, hmm. and played a 16th note in, but I didn't, my conscious brain was in the mix. And so I played the ink rather than the moment. Hmm. Now, some people are probably saying, no, you did the right thing. You should have played what's on the page. It's Brahms. Don't rewrite him. But in a way, I, you know, I've always wanted that moment back. I've always mm. wanted to almost kind of maybe in kind of a wry or playful way imitate the error from the pianist. Mm. I, I don't know if that makes sense. And again, there may be some people that are kind of climbing through the speakers saying, no, you shouldn't have done it. I wish I had actually played it wrong to mm. play the music instead of the ink. Mm. But that's just me. So I think that's a great example. I was not in flow at that time. I was thinking. I was I was in conscious evaluation of the musical moment rather than in expression mode. Yes. Yeah. And so how do we create that? I think you actually alluded to it a little bit. I, I think the thing that has to be on the front side of that is mastery. I think we have to have as complete a possible mastery of what we're doing. Mm. We have to have consumed that repertoire to such a degree that it's automatic. Mm. And so, Heidi, for me, that has real implications for whether we should memorize or not. I see. I like the idea of memorizing more when we can, even if you play with the music in front of you. Mm -hmm. Because to to memorize, to fully memorize, and I think there are degrees of memorization now. Uh, I, I haven't done psychological or neuroscience studies on these, but just in my own experience, there's memorization where I can sort of picture the page and remember what that looks like, and I can recreate that, or I can, you know, I, I have sort of this cognitive recollection of everything, and and there's that layer of memorization, and then there's kind of the layer of memorization where. I'm not even really thinking about that. I'm just playing the music. I'm fully invested in the music. Mm. And I'm not really thinking about, is this G sharp or G natural? I'm just, I'm, I'm playing what I know goes there. Mm. I don't know. How does that compare with your experience doing that? Yeah, I totally agree with the memorization aspect. Um, for example, I'm revisiting Burton's uh, Sonatina for flute and piano. And there are a lot of 30-second note runs. And I've decided that because I'm such a visual person, when I see that black ink, you know, and all those three, you know, black lines uh, indicating the 30-second notes, my brain freaks out and says, oh, you don't know it. Oh, my gosh, there's too many notes. But I do know it. If I allow my, like, professor logical brain to come through, I can say, no, mm -hmm. that's an E minor scale or that's a whole tone scale. Like I know exactly what it is. So mm -hmm. I've decided as I'm revisiting this piece that I'm just going to memorize the runs. So that way I don't have to look. I'm not going to be weird and look off the piece of paper and then come back <laughs> down. But just, you know, where I don't have to even think about it. And I can say, no, you know it. It's memorized. You don't have to visually look at it to make you like, you know, psychologically freak out. So I totally agree with the memorization aspect. And that's something I've been toying with my own playing too, is just, can I just memorize the piece and see what that does for my performance? Because again, like, if I see too much of the black and white, I get engrossed with that visual. But music is an aural art. The, the audience is there to hear me play. And so sometimes I don't really connect with the audience or the music through the acoustics you know, a flute or flute and piano, whatever it may be, because I'm so engrossed with the visual aspect of what's on my stand. So yeah, that's, 
the comment I would like to add in when you mentioned the memorization aspect. Yes, and I totally see how you're there. So if you'll bear with my being a neuroscience nerd for a second, let no, me kind of explain that in terms of, of what our brain waves do. So, so the front part of the brain, we call the prefrontal cortex, is responsible for a lot of the business that we do during our day. It's responsible for decision making, problem solving, planning, all these things we call executive functioning, right? And we all live in a world where it's just it's demanded of us that we we do a lot of that. We live in a cognitive world where it's just our job to kind of plan things. We have to get where somewhere on time. We have to make decisions. We have to solve problems. It's just how we roll. And so when we look at the actual brain waves, and we we talk about brain waves in terms of, of uh, actually in much the way we talk about music, we talk about amplitude and we talk about frequency. And so, of course, in music, pitch is frequency and volume is amplitude. Mm. In brain waves, we look at frequency and we kind of group those into what we call bands. And so the slowest brain waves uh, occur between zero and four cycles per second. Uh, we call those delta waves. Right above that, between four and eight cycles per second, or hertz, we call those theta waves. From eight to 12 is alpha waves. And then above that, there's a couple of the distinctions kind of depend on the person and what we're doing. But above that, we call those beta waves. And there's low beta waves between, say, 13 and about, call it between 15 and 20 cycles per second. And then above that are the high beta waves, which are really fast. Now, we like for those to have different intensities and proportions around the brain, depending on what we're doing. Now, the reason this matters for us is when you're in a, let's say you're sight reading a new piece, you sit down with a student and the student brings a duet that is challenging that you've never seen. And the student says, hey, you know, let's let's read through this. So you sit down. And so the prefrontal cortex, the problem solving analysis part of your brain goes into high gear. Hmm. And the part of your brain that really needs to be working well there, the, the brain waves that really uh, are most efficient in problem solving and things like reading a new piece are these low beta waves, these 15 to 20, give or take a little cycles per second. And so if I were to put you in an EEG cap and have you just sitting calmly and then have you start some kind of a performance task, then ideally what happens is those low beta waves become more intense. Mm. Okay. And that's what allows your brain to make a lot of solve a lot of problems on the fly and make a lot of decisions and read the notes which are new and unfamiliar to you. And so when we're thinking hard about solving a problem, we're doing our math homework with our kids or we're, you know, doing whatever, then low beta waves in the front part of the brain need to be fairly robust. Mm -hmm. As an aside, what we see a lot with ADHD that you hear a lot of right now is we tend to see a lot of those slower waves, the theta waves, tend to be too strong in the front of the brain. And so that's what makes us kind of brain foggy, makes us hard for us to organize and to focus and to make decisions. And so when I'm talking with people in that world, I, I explain it's kind of like trying to get on the highway with your car stuck in second gear. Hmm. The part of your brain that's supposed to be trucking along pretty fast can't because those slow theta waves in other contexts and parts of the brain are incredibly useful. But in this context, not very helpful mm. <laughs> because we need the brain solving problems. Okay. So you with me so far on this? I, yes. Okay. So that's when we are thinking hard about what we're doing. That's when we're focused in the moment. And so that's not just when we're reading a new piece. That's when we are not at complete mastery with a piece. That's when we know a piece. You know, and so maybe you did you say it was the Burton Sonatina? Is that mm -hmm. the, the piece you were talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay, so with the Burton, so it sounds like you're still in a place in your work on that piece that you're you're still in executive function mode on okay. that piece. You're still making decisions, you're still interpreting and analyzing, and you know, you're probably in analysis mode on that. And so the conversations between your brain and your body are kind of focused in that way. We okay. all are there. That's kind of, you know, that's one level of achievement. I don't think we have to have memorized a piece to move beyond that. But I think when we, but often we do, or I don't know if you've ever had this, that you don't know you've memorized a piece. You just figure out that you have. Yes. Which for me was always, that was the only way I could memorize. So when my friends would, you know, getting ready for a, a competition would memorize 
a phrase and then they'd memorize the next phrase and then the next phrase. I could never do that. <laughs> I, that's just not how I worked. And so it was always kind of a scary experience. Am I going to get this memorized in time? And then sure enough, a week or two before the show, I, you know, I just turned my stand around and play and it was okay. And it worked for me. It scared the heck out of my teacher sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, so anyway, but some people are really good at that kind of methodical you know, phrase by phrase memorization. And I, I always kind of envied them a little bit. Anyway, I think when we get to true mastery of a piece, when we really have consumed that in ways that we're just at a new level, what happens neurologically is actually the, the beta waves go way down in the front of the brain hmm. and the slower waves tend to pick up. And in fact, and it affects our error detection uh, system as well. There's a part of the brain that is, I mean, if you go kind of straight back behind your eyebrows, straight back behind the, the space right between your eyebrows, back a couple inches and up a little bit, it's, uh, it's called the anterior cingulate cortex. And right around there, when we perceive that we've made an error, very quickly, like 10 times faster than cognition or more, the brain throws up a theta wave. It throws up a very slow wave. Hmm. Now, if you've achieved mastery, that's no big deal because you're already, that part of the brain is already kind of slowing down. And, you know, when you talk to athletes who have really mastered the game, when the game gets intense, they talk about things slowing down out on the, out on the court or on the field. And so for Russell Westbrook, when things get really intense, you know, if you put me out there, it would seem very fast. Uh, oh. One, because I'm five seven <laughs> and not very athletic. But another is because I don't have mastery of that. And so I'm, I'm going to constantly be in problem solving mode. Whereas Russell Westbrook gets out there and things slow down for him. Hmm. And, and you hear athletes talk about this all the time. And I think neurologically, that is literally what happens. I think the, the problem solving part of the brain slows down. And so we may logically wonder, well, does that make us more mistake prone? Well, no, because we've really learned that on a new level. Hmm. Okay. And so when we get to that new level of achievement and mastery, we don't need our brains to figure out, oh, this passage is in E minor. We just, mm. we know how it feels. Okay. See what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. That's why I think there's a connection between mastery and memorization. It, probably not always that case, but I, I do think there's a connection. I think that's also why doing things like practicing in mixed rhythms can help us learn passages because what that literally does is it takes that same passage and it cuts a new path around the cortex. Okay. It literally rewires the brain to understand that in new ways. And so it allows us to take detours more effectively uh, when things don't go as planned. Hmm. And so in terms of flow, I don't know, I'd be curious to talk to more musicians about this, but I kind of wonder if for musicians, things do kind of slow down for them on stage. Mm. I know that for me, I sort of lose track of time when I get into that that place. Mm -hmm. And kind of like we talked about in, in the last episode, I've come off of performances where I'm conducting and my, my players have come up to me, my students have said, so Dr. Neil, how did it go? And my only response is, I, I have no idea. I'm going to have to listen to the recording because I don't know. Mm. And so I think we just kind of get into that zone where we almost lose that sense of self. Yeah. So mastery, I think, is absolutely critical in that. I think without mastery, we are in problem solving mode. Okay. And so I, I think you're right. It starts there. That was kind of a long way to say you're right. It starts there. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, no, it, all the information is really, it is needed to understand your straight response. You know, you can say, yes, yeah. it's needed. But all of that was very informative and needed, I think. Here, here's where it gets kind of fun for me, because I, I mentioned earlier that kind of predominance of theta waves, the slow waves in the front of the brain can kind of slow things down and can create those ADHD struggles when we are in that in that moment. But when you're in a moment of mastery and you're creating, I don't think it holds us back because we don't need our problem solving skills. But here's what's fun about theta. And the way I can describe theta, when the brain is in a theta state, the easiest way is when you're lying in bed at night and you're trying to go to sleep and you're not completely asleep, you're not completely awake. And have you ever had this experience where when you're in that state, you're almost about to doze off? One of two things can sometimes happen. One is you might actually have kind of really strange or bizarre thoughts. Mm -hmm. Or the other is maybe sometimes you'll remember something or solve 
solve a problem. You'll remember where you put your keys that you haven't found in three <laughs> days or something like that. Have, have, have you ever had those things happen? Yeah. You? Yeah. Okay. That's theta. Okay. So when I did my master's in music at University of Texas, we had a, a musicology professor named uh, Dr. Elliot Anacolitz. And any musicologist out there will know him. I mean, he's brilliant and he had photographic memory. And he did this amazing analysis of the Album Berg Lyric Suite where he kind of uncovered a lot of numerology in the serialism for the Berg Lyric Suite. And it actually kind of was um, autobiographical with Album Berg's life. And if I remember right, maybe even like an extramarital affair or something. It was kind of bizarre in that way. And the folklore among the students was that he actually discovered that in his sleep. Hmm. I never talked to him about it, so I don't know if it was true. But knowing what I know now about Theta, I actually believe it because what may have happened is he may have actually been like almost asleep and kind of in a state of Theta, which would then put his brain in this hypnagogic, hyper creative state. That would then allow him to see through the noise that we have when we're making conscious decisions about our daily lives. Hmm. And so I make room for that. I don't know. I never got to talk to him about it, but it kind of makes sense and it's fun to think about. But when we can get the brain into that slow down state in the right way, in a flow state, not only does it get us out of this hyper evaluative place, but it also kind of taps into creativity in our in our own minds that we don't necessarily have access to when we're not in that state. Okay. So for example, like okay. the box partita in A minor has four movements and I have been playing it since high school. So I've been playing it for 15 plus years. I know that piece. I know it inside and out. I know I've mastered everything there is to know about it. And of course it's Bach and you still find new patterns and <laughs> right. It's, <laughs> right. it's a never ending process. But the recording session that I mentioned, you know, two weeks ago and a couple of days ago, you know, that inner chatter is still there. And I want to be in flow. Like I want it to be enjoyable. I want to have that experience where your student comes up to you and says, how did it go? And you're like, I don't know. We'll have to listen to the recording. Like, why am I still then very much present with the music and evaluating what's going on when I just wanted to shut off and I just want to get into that flow. So that way I have this state where it's, it's more enjoyable rather than I feel like I'm constantly evaluating as the music is progressing. Yes. I mean, we all sort of aspire to have this, maybe a transcendent experience where the music that we hear in our heads and feel in our hearts, we can then convey to our audiences uh -huh. and have them sort of understand and experience that in ways that we experience it internally. Is that maybe kind yes. of what you're getting at? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, Heidi, I think it's important to remember that that none of this happens in a vacuum. And so there are so many components to every musical experience that are going to influence that everything to do with our own psyche, to what happened to you that day, to even the environment that we're making music in. So for example, in a recording session, we haven't talked about that recording session at length, but I'm sort of putting myself in that situation. I'm thinking, okay, well, if I'm at the studio, there's a lot of pressure to produce there because A, there's people there that I don't know or haven't worked with. And I'm wondering, you know, what do they think of my playing? And am I boring them? And if I'm paying for studio time, I have this pressure of, gosh, if I don't do this, it's going to cost me a lot of extra money because I've got to get more takes of this and it's got to be right. And, you know, so there are so many other things. I mean, hmm. not only about the situation, just about our uh, just about our daily lives. You know, if I'm driving to a performance and somebody cuts me off and gives me the year number one sign as they're zooming past, that's going to affect my music making. How could it hmm. not, right? Right. And so, Heidi, I think I think it calls on us to really do a lot of work on self-compassion okay. because I think I think what it's important for us to do is to just be able to be present and self-compassionate in the moment and realize that any performance is not just a reflection of our musicianship. It's a reflection of of our hearts, minds and bodies in that moment, in that situation, in that experience. Hmm. So there's a lot more context to any performance, whether it's live or recorded, than just simply this is the music that I hear in my head and feel in my heart that I want to get out to my audience. It's not that simple. Hmm. 
And I think one of the things that can help us is to carve out some space for ourselves to just be us in the moment Mm -hmm. and to embrace our flaws and our fallibilities and embrace how that's reflected in the music, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and realize that with the Bach, for example, you're not just representing Bach, you're, you're representing yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think the more we can allow ourselves to get into that place of personal acceptance in general, I think that can help calm the chatter. And so I I think in some ways, embracing error, embracing fallibility tends to reduce error and fallibility Mm -hmm. because the the less we fear that, the the less we're likely to kind of be conflicted by that noise. Mm. There is something that has helped me in the past. I will say before a recording session or a performance, and I'm still experimenting with it, but I will tell myself, before going into the booth or the stage, you are allowed three mistakes or you are allowed five mistakes. And then that just gives me permission to make a mistake because I'm human. And rather than don't make a mistake, because if you say don't make a mistake, well, that's stupid because you're going to make a mistake. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You know, and you're not a machine. You're not a MIDI machine. But I didn't mean to use the word stupid. I hate the word stupid. But I'm calling my, <laughs> calling that situation kind of silly because, I mean, it's inevitable. You know, you're going to make a mistake somewhere. I don't know. So just giving myself permission does feel more freeing. Absolutely. Because I, I think when we make the demand that that we not make mistakes, let's let's pretend for a second like we do give a flawless performance, which we all know as musicians isn't really even possible. That's not even authentic. That's not even human. Mm-hmm. That's not that's not truly a reflection of of who we are as people in that moment in time and so i think that and again this is where self compassion becomes big and uh you know you and i were talking earlier that i'm actually putting together kind of an online resource for musicians and kind of making myself a- available to people for uh for coaching on on performance coaching that sort of thing sort of a juxtaposition of my work as a music teacher for 20 years and my work as a, as a therapist and performance coach. And a big part of my work when I've worked with, you know, college and professional athletes and corporate CEOs and performing artists, it, it always gets back down to self-compassion and how do we hold space for ourselves to be us in the moment. Hmm. And I think that, you know, I, I try not to speak in absolutes, but I think that might be one, you know, I think that's just a prerequisite that, that if we're going to find flow, if we're going to find that moment, those times in our performances where we are unencumbered by self-judgment, by self-doubt, by problem solving, I think it has to start with just being able to hold space for ourselves. And I think, honestly, that starts without the instrument in our hands. I think that starts just in our everyday practice as humans. And when we learn to do that as individuals, we can then learn to do that as musicians. And yeah, they're going to cross-pollinate. But for musicians, we all have so much at stake just in our own identities as musicians, as people. Hmm. You know, I mean, I I think when when you talk to someone who makes music, they don't say, I do music. They say, I am a musician. I think for most all of us, even if we leave one career and then, you know, become computer programmers or psychotherapists or whatever, I think we still identify as musicians. And so our sense of self, our personal identity still rooted in that ability to create art. And so, yeah, I, I think I think self-compassion is absolutely crucial. And I, whether whether it's someone who's just trying to get through their life uh, who's not a musician or someone who's trying to figure out how to not melt down on the pitcher's mound in a baseball game. I think it always starts there. It starts with holding space for yourself. There's some great books I can recommend. And also in the, in the course that I'm going to be making available, the first part of it's going to be free on the website, uh, on my website. And I think we're going to link that in the show notes, but it's chrisneal.com. One of the books I can recommend is a book called The Compassionate Mind by Paul Gilbert. Now, Gilbert advocates for Buddhist thought a lot. And so you just need to be going in. If that's not your jam, then just know that's going to be a part of it. But even if you don't have any Buddhist proclivities, then then uh, just some amazing information about 
just how do we hold space for ourselves? Another one that is really great is a book called Buddha's Brain. And I should remember the name of the author, but it escapes me right now. But Buddha's Brain talks a lot about this intersection between neuroscience and self-compassion and Eastern thought. And those things are really useful, I think, as we begin to learn how to hold space for ourselves and our own imperfections. Today's conversation continues into episode 95, which is part two. Check out next week's episode to hear the remainder of this conversation. Thank you. Today's sponsor is brought to you by J&K Productions. Did you know that not only are they a production company for podcasts, but they are a recording company for musicians? Any musical recording needs that you may have, J&K Productions can fulfill that need. They have all the necessary equipment and expertise to record your next flute recording for college or graduate auditions, competitions, summer festivals, or a flute album. J&K Productions can record any setup imaginable, from solo flute, small chamber, flute and piano, and much more. Consider J&K Productions for your next recording project. Contact them at jkproductions.media. Thank you for listening to the Flute 360 podcast. For more information, please visit HeidiKBegay.com. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review in the iTunes store. Let's talk about flute.